Good afternoon and welcome to the Narrow Path radio broadcast. My name is Steve Gregg and we're live for an hour each weekday afternoon. We take your phone calls. We have an open phone line and you can call in if you have questions you'd like to raise for discussion about the Bible or about Christianity um, or anything related thereto that might interest a Christian uh, audience or even a non-Christian audience who's thinking about uh, Christian things or the Bible. Uh, it's a pretty broad, pretty broad field there you can call in about. Also, uh, if you don't have a question but you happen to disagree with the host about anything you've heard him say on the program, that's me, uh, feel free to give me a call. You can uh, balance comment. We'll talk about the areas that you may not see the same way. The number to call is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737 if you'd like to be on the program. We have lines open right now, and uh, quite a few lines are open at the moment, so if you want to call, this is a good time to get through. It may not be as easy to get through later on. 844 484 5737. And before I uh, take a call, I, I want to uh, mention again, this will be my last opportunity uh, before tonight. Uh, I am in uh, Honolulu teaching at the Youth with a Mission base in Manoa Valley, and they have a public meeting, a community meeting, every Thursday night. I'm a guest speaker in their school, and they usually have the guest speaker uh, speak if he's available. So I'm going to be speaking tonight, uh, and it's open to the public. So if you happen to be a Honolulu listener, and we do have quite a few, you may be interested in joining us tonight. It's at 6.30 at the Youth with a Mission Base in uh, Manoa. Now, if you don't know where that is, it's actually right next, it's almost right next door to the University of Hawaii in Honolulu. Uh, there's just one building between the university and the YWAM base, and that's a, I think it's a Catholic girls' school. But uh, Youth with a Mission... Uh, is uh, I'm sure you could look it up online, or you just go to our website, thenarrowpath.com, and look under announcements, and you'll find the address there. And uh, that's 6:30 tonight at the Youth with a Mission base in the Manoa Valley. All right, in Honolulu. Let's talk to Rebecca from Washington D.C., who is a fairly regular caller. R Rebecca, good to hear from Hi. you again. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um. So today I was wondering um, under what circumstances it would be appropriate to rebaptize someone who was baptized young, like four or five years old, who did believe at the time, but whose profession of faith was very simple. Well, I think a person at four or five could be a true Christian. And if they are a true Christian at the time they're converted, but obviously at that age they don't understand very much, um, I think their baptism is is, uh, is is legitimate. Now, if somebody is baptized as an infant, and so and a great number of people have been because they go to churches that practice that, um, that'd be a different story because someone who's baptized as an infant was baptized before they became a believer. And I believe that the biblical pattern is to have someone repent and be baptized that has become a, an actual believer. Be, uh, they repent first. And they have to believe to do that, and then, they, then they're baptized. I think baptism is for believers, not for unbelievers. Now, a little baby is not a believer, and therefore the practice of uh, baptizing infants is not found in Scripture and not something that I would necessarily feel uh, that I could recommend. And so when people have been baptized as infants, I think that for them to be rebaptized after they become a believer is appropriate and biblical. Now, if somebody's four or five, there's some question as to what they knew and why they did it. There are certainly people who are in their early childhood who get baptized under some pressure from their parents or to imitate older brothers or sisters or, or for some other reason and who don't really know the Lord or don't really have a commitment to the Lord. If that's the case then those who are baptized at that age are very much like those who were baptized as infants. And I think that being rebaptized is uh, appropriate. But if the person really had believed in the Lord, though they didn't understand as much as they later did in their adult life, if they really had loved the Lord and wanted to be committed to Christ at that age and were baptized, then I don't think they have to be rebaptized. It sounds like they were already a convert. Uh, so that would be my, my thoughts. Now, if someone says, but yeah, but what does a four or five-year-old even know? They don't understand the atonement. 
they don't understand the Trinity, they don't understand, you know, you know, these kinds of things that we might understand more when we're older. Well, that may be true, but I suspect that uh, in the early days of the church, or even throughout church history, even adults who have gotten converted and were baptized didn't have very much understanding of these things because they would baptize somebody the same day that they heard, they'd hear the gospel, they'd get saved that day, and they'd get baptized that day. So, you know, they couldn't have a very sophisticated understanding of their theology. And we have to assume that it's the commitment that one makes to Christ that qualifies them to be baptized into his body in baptism. And then after that, of course, their understanding will deepen and broaden, and uh, they'll understand theology somewhat more as they get older. Um, I guess I have one more question also. Like, uh -huh. what about somebody who um, believed at the time, but then later in life stops believing, or is at least not super Christian, but then becomes like a real Christian later yeah. on? Yeah. Well, if somebody is a believer as a child... <laughs> And then they walk away from God, and in their, let's say, their early adult life, they're they're not believers, they're not Christians. Uh, then there's a good uh, good reason to believe that their childhood experience was not it didn't it didn't take it wasn't really maybe that genuine. They might have been just pleasing their parents or something else, and therefore I think that when they come back to the Lord, they should be baptized again. Um, uh, if if they have. Uh, Again, if their conversion was legitimate and, and genuine when they were young and they simply had a time of ignorance where they weren't following Christ very well because they hadn't been told very much about how to do so, I don't know if, you know, once they learn to be a better Christian, I don't know that they would have to be baptized again. This is, the real issue is going to have to be, you know, were they really a Christian when they were baptized? That would be the issue I would be concerned about. And uh, that, you know, that may not be the easiest thing to answer. In some cases, it'd be fairly easy to answer, but some cases, you know, it's a fine line. If somebody feels that maybe they should get baptized again because they're not sure they were a Christian before, then I think they should. It doesn't hurt. It certainly doesn't hurt anything to be baptized again. Not these days. Back when people first started doing this back in the days of the Anabaptists, they got themselves martyred for that because the infant baptizing churches considered rebaptism uh, to be a rejection of those churches' baptism, and uh, and they actually persecuted people who got baptized again. But uh, we don't have that going on, so there's no no reason that a person couldn't be baptized again if they had any doubts. I'm sorry. Is, is that okay? Yeah. All right. Hey, I've got more calls to take, so I'm going to go take them. But Rebecca, um, I, I know who your parents are now. I met your dad once, uh, and he, so I, he wrote uh -huh. to me once and told me he's your dad. So okay. say hi to them for me. Okay, definitely. <laughs> All right. God bless you. Bye now. Uh, John from Beaverton, Oregon. Welcome to the Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Now turn left. Hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, last time we called... Uh, yeah, I asked you if it's enough to believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. And if I recall correctly, you said no. So my question today is, is confessing Jesus Christ enough for salvation? By 5.2 miles. Okay, I'm hearing your, your uh, maps talking to you here. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll be glad to talk to you about that. Um, it, when you said, is it enough to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, and you say, I said no, I'd have, to, I'd have to put a finer point on that. I believe we are saved by believing on Christ for salvation. But we have to understand what that means. Believing on Christ means that we believe he's the Christ, the Messiah. That means he's the king. The word Messiah refers to the anointed king. So that's what Christ means. So if you believe in Christ, you believe in him as your king or as Paul put it, as your Lord in Romans 10, 9. He said, if you, confess, if, you believe in your, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. So obviously, yes, you are saved by believing, but it matters what you believe. See, some people believe certain things about Jesus, but it doesn't have any impact on them. They don't, they don't uh, submit to him as Lord, which means they don't really believe that he's the Lord. They don't believe he's their king. Uh, 
because if they did, they'd obey him. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things I say? Obviously, it's, it doesn't make sense. Uh, a person has to believe, but they also have to, you know, their belief has to be something more than just a verbal acquiescence. Now, you said, do you have to confess Christ? Well, that verse says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. So it does talk about confession. And of course, uh, I'll put it this way. If a person came to believe in Christ on their deathbed and there's no one else present and no one to confess Christ to, then obviously there'd be no reason for them to make a confession. There's, they're not in touch with anybody. There's no one listening to them. Uh, they, they can simply you know, speak to God, but they don't have to you know, confess before men. But Jesus did say, if you're not willing to confess me before men, then I won't confess you before my Father, which is in heaven. If you believe something to be true, and if it's your true conviction, you've got to be willing to own your convictions. And that means that when the occasion arises for people to know whether you're a Christian or not, if you fail to confess that he's your Lord, then you're probably not really a believer. Or if you are a believer, you're sinning and need to need to repent of that. Remember, Peter denied that he knew Jesus three times, though Peter was certainly a believer and a disciple and even an apostle, but he denied the Lord, but he didn't mean it, and he did repent of it. But so, I mean, in a weak point, a Christian might fail to confess Christ when he should have confessed him. That's not going to send someone to hell. But you're not, you're not saved because you, you tick a, a, the right number of boxes. Okay, I, I can tick the believe box. I can tick the a box that says repent. I can tick the baptize box. Oh, I got to do the confession box now. Uh, it's not about ticking the right boxes. It's about having a, a, a relationship with Christ and with God that comes through s- surrender. That before we are converted, we are serving ourselves. And as such, we are denying Christ his claim over us because he is our Lord. We're supposed to serve him. As long as we're not serving him or serving ourselves, we are at war with him over the territory of our lives. And you can't be a Christian while you're still at war with God. Paul said, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. So obviously, if you're justified, you're not at war with God. You're at peace with God. But the only way to be at peace with God is to not be at war with him. To, you have to surrender. You've lived your life. If you've lived in sin and not as a Christian, you've, you've lived in rebellion against God. You have to surrender to him and his lordship. That's what believing is. Because if you don't, then you don't really believe. What are you, you have to believe something very specific. You have to believe that he's the king. He's the Lord. He's the Messiah. And believing that means that you believe that you're supposed to obey him. And that's your determination to do. If you don't have that, then you're not a believer. And if you do believe it, you will confess him on the occasions where that becomes uh, an appropriate thing. Now, I think in the early church, when people became believers, uh, as they were being baptized, they were required to confess Christ. And it's still practiced in many cases with baptism, that a person confesses that Jesus is their Lord. If a person's not willing to do that, then they can't be saved, in my opinion, because it means they're not committed to him. They're not surrendered to him. Uh, They're ashamed of him. Jesus, if you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. So uh, being a Christian does mean that you're wholeheartedly a believer and you you wholeheartedly embrace Christ uh, as the Lord that he is. And if you don't embrace him as Lord, then you're rebelling against him being Lord. And that's not, not what Christians are. Christians are not rebels against God. They're followers of Christ by definition. So uh, confessing Christ, I wouldn't be legalistic about it and say, well, this person died you know, when no one was in the room, but he gave his, yeah, you know, he, he, he gave his heart to the Lord, as far as we know. Well, he might be saved, even if he didn't have a chance to confess Christ to anybody. But I think that most people don't repent on their deathbed. Most people, after they repent to become Christians, they have interaction with people. And those people are going to be people who will know, because they will tell them, I'm, I'm a follower of Christ now. So, I guess people, some people could be saved without making a verbal confession in, under certain circumstances, but it certainly would not be normal. It'd be the exception. It's faith in Christ as Messiah, and that faith means a full embracing of that reality that makes a person a follower of Christ and a Christian. 
All right. Um, did you have anything more to say about that? Well, uh, yeah, uh, you know, uh, uh, Calvin, uh, Calvin had uh, Michael, Michael Savitas burned at the stake. Uh, do you believe that was right for Calvin to do that? What do you think I think about that? I'm sorry? Can you guess my answer? Uh, I would think you would probably, no, I know I can't. I can't guess your answer. You cannot guess my answer. When you ask, was it right for Calvin to burn Michael Cervantes at the stake? You don't know what my answer would be. Uh, well, my answer would be, it's never right to burn somebody at the stake. And Calvin did it with without any good grounds at all. Uh, Michael Cervantes was not an Orthodox believer. He didn't believe in the Trinity, but he did love the Lord, and he did call out on Christ, uh, not only in his lifetime, but even while he was being burned at the stake, he was still calling out on Christ. And Calvin, who's supposed to have been a Christian, was killing somebody who, who loved Jesus. Uh, now, I don't believe we should kill anybody. I don't think Christians should kill even people who hate Jesus. But to kill somebody who loves Jesus is absolutely uh, inexcusable, in my opinion. So I think Calvin was a great criminal in, in doing that. Uh, and I'm very surprised that you didn't know that I'd think that was a bad thing. So I, maybe you haven't listened to me but for a few minutes. But if you've listened to me for more than a day or two, I think you would know that like everybody. Does anybody think it was right? I, I, don't, I don't know if I know anyone who think it, thought it was right for uh, Calvin to do that. All right, let's talk to uh, Andrew from New Hampshire. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hi. Uh, quick question for you about uh, Moses. I, I called in earlier and asked about Moses. And, um, so why, why is there no heritage of Moses? He has children, um, and, like, who... Uh, Jethro was a priest of Midian, but a, a priest of, of what? Uh, well, like, what god? And and then why why did Moses not include his children um, in what he was doing with with Israel? Well, as far as I know, Moses did include his children. He didn't give them positions as priests like his brother Aaron had. But um, there are a few scattered references in the book of Chronicles where there's genealogies. There's quite a few chapters of genealogy in the books of Chronicles. And some of the descendants of Moses are mentioned. Uh, they didn't oh. become kings. They didn't become kings or prophets or priests, as far as we know. But they did have, uh, some of them uh, who descended from Moses had some positions in government. I, I don't have those verses at my fingertips. And, you know, there's, there's many chapters of genealogies and chronicles. But I was actually, uh, it, just coincidentally, I was looking at those passages today. But there's a verse here and a verse there, and I don't remember the references. But... Um, on, on, I've, I've actually never been asked that subject before, but I was looking up a topic similar to it this morning, and uh, and I happened to discover that there's references to those who were descended from Moses. So, even though in the in the story of Moses we don't hear about his sons anymore after we hear that they were born, um, and we don't hear about them in the book of Joshua or Judges or in most of the historical books. Yet, in, in the books of Chronicles, which gives some more detail about those kinds of things, a lot of genealogical information, we find that the sons of Moses were part of Israel, and some of the later ones had uh, roles to play in the, in the government of the nation of Judah. Not, not the highest positions, but they were, you know, they had some positions. Okay, it's surprising because you'd think they'd end up being like princes or something, you know? Yeah, but Moses wasn't a king, uh, you know, and the, and Israel wasn't didn't have any kings until the time of Saul, so they would either have to be judges, or maybe generals like Joshua, but Joshua, I think Joshua is more qualified to be Moses' successor, um, because Joshua had served Moses from his youth. Uh, I think Moses' children were separated from him in the early years. I think that his wife. Zipporah lived with her father, the priest of Midian, uh, when Moses was wandering in the wilderness. And uh, so 
I think that Moses didn't have that much contact with his sons uh, in their childhood, but another young man was quite closely attached to Moses as a, as a you know assistant, and that was Joshua, and he naturally ended up taking the role of Moses' successor. Okay, so who, what was Jethro the priest of? Well, he would have been the priest of who, whichever gods the Midianites at that time were worshiping. They might have been worshiping uh, Yahweh. It's hard to say because the Midianites are descended from Abraham. After, uh, after Sarah died, we read that Abraham married a woman named Keturah, and she had six sons for Abraham. And although they didn't amount to much in the story of Abraham, one of them was Midian, and the Midianites descended from him. So this would now be several generations later, uh, maybe as much as, you know, uh, you know, four or five, six generations later. But the Midianites might have been worshiping the same God Abraham did. Now, at a later time, they wouldn't. Eventually, these, these nations around Israel started worshiping pagan gods. The Moabites and the Ammonites and the Midianites and Edomites all had different gods than Yahweh at a certain point in their history. But it's possible that at that early point, they were all, because of their relationship with Abraham, still people who knew Yahweh. Okay, cool. Thank you. All right. Well, God bless you, Andrew. Thanks for your call. Good talking Thanks. to you. Thanks. All right. Um, all right. Our next caller is Crystal. Uh, I'm sorry. I accidentally hung up. I, I hit the wrong button for you, Crystal. My apologies. Please call back because I, I do want to talk to you. I, I thought I was hitting a different button. and I hung up on Crystal. So, Crystal, please call back. I want to hear your question. Uh, she's calling right back now. So I'm going to just wait a second to let her get through. And do uh, do do do. I just want to remind you that we have a website with full of resources. There, everything's free there. The narrowpath.com has uh, over fifteen hundred of my lectures on uh, on audio MP3s. You can download them for free. Oops, Crystal's not there. She did call back, but she's now not there. So I don't know. Oh, she's calling back now. Let me take another call. We'll get to her afterwards. Let's talk to Mike from Michigan. Mike, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. Thanks for taking my call. Uh-huh. Um, I was just calling because um, um, I'm 27 years old. Um, I would, I guess, consider myself a millennial. And uh, I look at people my age, uh, some of my peers I went to high school with, and I'm really burdened for my generation. Um, so many of them aren't in church, and a lot of them don't even have families um yeah and so and i've got two kids i I don't really relate a lot to a lot of my uh peers even uh even now and so i i just wanted to ask what your thoughts were as far as what do you think the best approach is to reaching not only my generation but just thinking about my children's generation um you know, what do we do in this kind of environment that we're living in? Um, I mean, obviously, instilling as much of the Word of God into my children as possible. But as far as just people I come in contact with that are my age that are, you know, just living for themselves or, you know, yeah. doing their own thing, um, finding God, you know, in their workout routines or whatever, like they tend to say. Sure. You know, what? what do we do for... From my well, I have to. I just have to admit, I don't have a strategy worked out for reaching millennials, and I, I would have to say that you know the style of ministry I do might not be the most effective for millennials because uh, it seems to me like the majority of my audience are older people like myself, uh, and and part of that is due to cultural change. Uh, for example, I came up in the Jesus movement. The ba- I'm a baby boomer, and in the Jesus movement, people my age. They really wanted to know God. They really wanted to uh, learn the Bible, for example. There, there were thousands and thousands of baby boomers converted in a really short time in the early 70s. And those are the kind of people that, well, that's what I am. I'm a, I'm a product of the Jesus movement. And also, uh, you know, the people who follow my ministry with, uh, are, are very largely people of, that, of my generation. I've noticed because when I hold meetings, most of the people are. However, I do notice a growing number of millennials who show up at these meetings and who call, and that's very encouraging. But the culture of the millennials is very different, as you pointed out. 
And while I had some experience winning baby boomers to Christ, I haven't really gotten to know what's going to work well for the millennials. I wish I did know because it's a very important thing. Um, uh, I'm afraid you're going to have to probably get some books written by Christians who have some effective ministry toward the millennials because the presuppositions of your generation are generally not the same as yours. I'm I'm thinking probably you were raised by Christians. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, and so you you learned from an early age, and that's I think that's going to be the hope for your children too. Uh, their generation is going to be raised by most of their parents not knowing much about God. It's going to be a smaller remnant of the population who really know God, but you've got to be determined that you know you have a good influence on your generation and on your children. And you just have to trust God for the results. I wish I could give you a point-by-point strategy, and that'd be great. If I knew that, I could probably write a best-selling book, but I, I don't. I don't know what's going to reach these people. Uh, prayer for revival is what I'm relying on, but there may be other steps that could be taken by someone more knowledgeable than myself in this area. I'm sorry to have to leave you with that. I wish I could give you a, a really good answer. You're listening to The Narrow Path. We have to take a break for about 30 seconds. We'll come back for another half hour, so stay tuned. Small is the gate and narrow is the path that leads to life. We're proud to welcome you to The Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Steve has nothing to sell you today but everything to give you. When today's radio show is over, we invite you to visit thenarrowpath.com where you'll find topical audio teachings, blog articles, verse-by-verse teachings, and the archives of all the radio shows. Study, learn, and enjoy. We thank you for supporting the listener-supported Narrow Path with Steve Gregg. Welcome to The Narrow Path. My name is Steve Gregg. We are taking phone calls for another half hour. This is the second half of our program. If you'd like to call with questions about the Bible or about the Christian faith, feel free to give me a call at this number. It is 844-484-5737. That's 844-484-5737. And in our first half hour, Crystal called, and when I was trying to put her on the air, I hit the wrong button and hung up on her. So she's called back, thankfully, and we get to talk to her now. Hi, Crystal. Welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling back. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? I just had a quick question for you. I wanted Uh to know if you could just give a few points, maybe four or five or however many you think, on how would a person know if they're in a church that's that's a cult? And I I, I don't mean like the glaring – signs like, you know, um, the Branch Davidians where, you know, the feds had to get involved, Uh Jim Jones. But I'm talking about churches that kind of operate subtly for many, many years, um, but they may be a cult. And so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. And I can take it off the air. Okay. Thanks, Crystal, for that that call. Yeah. Uh, You know, I think... We have to define what a cult is first, so you can know if the church you're attending is one. What is a cult? Well, most Christians would say a cult is a group that denies certain important key orthodox doctrines of the Christian faith that have historically been accepted. One of those doctrines that people often hold out for is the doctrine of the Trinity. They say if a a group doesn't believe in the Trinity, that's a cult. Now, I would say that a, a group that teaches false doctrine is definitely teaching heresy. But a cult is, I would actually define, not so much in terms of their doctrine, because there are groups that teach okay doctrine and, and believe in the Trinity and believe in most of the Orthodox teachings of the Church, but they're still cult-like. But it just depends on what you're calling a cult. The, the word cult is not really found in the Bible, so we have to just say, well, how are we using the term? To me, a cult... Uh, and I think of the classic ones that are uh, that I've grew up knowing as cults it would be like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and uh, Christian Science and, and some of these groups. And then there's a lot of Eastern religion cults that have come into the country in since the 70s. These cults are mainly characterized by the lack of liberty of thought. 
That is, people in them are not encouraged to think for themselves. Instead, there's a leader or an organization that thinks for you. They interpret the Bible for you. If you think differently than they do, that's not okay. Uh, you have to see it their way, even though many times uh, it may well be that the, the church historically has seen things very differently than this group does, but they still insist that they're the ones who are right. And, uh, and they may be right about some things. After all, the historic church could be wrong about some things, but the point is it's, it's just that you don't have the liberty of thought. The Bible says in, in 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. You want to be in a church where the spirit of the Lord is, and there's going to be liberty. What you have in many churches, and this could be even in denominational churches at times, it depends on the individual church. For example, I was raised a Baptist. I would certainly not describe the Baptist denomination as a cult, not even a little bit. And the church I was raised in was not a cult. But I have known of Baptist churches where the pastor was so controlling that people were afraid to disagree with him. It, that's more of a sociological dynamic. It's more of a personal dynamic than it is a theological one. But that's cultic. When people feel like they're not allowed to think for themselves, they're not allowed to disagree with the leader. Um, if they disagree with the leader, they'll get slapped down or they'll maybe kicked out. Uh, they'll be seen as a threat. Well, then you've got a cultic element there in the group. The, the theology may not be heretical, but the, the, the social dynamics of the group is cult-like. Uh, you see, everyone is supposed to be able to follow Christ according to their conscience. Paul said that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. He said the head of every man is Christ. So every, every Christian person has Christ as their head, and we're supposed to be following Christ. Now, the Bible doesn't say the head of every man is his pastor or the elders of his church or the founder of his movement or the organization that they belong to. That, that's not the head of anybody. Uh, Paul actually, I mean, Jesus told his apostles. Now, if anyone was a spiritual authority in the churches, it was the apostles. But Jesus told the apostles, don't let anyone call you rabbi or father or teacher. You have only one of those, and that's God. And, and Jesus is your teacher, and, uh, and you're all brothers. So essentially, Jesus set things up so that leaders in the church are not supposed to be the boss. They're not supposed to be dictators. They're not supposed to control people's thinking. They're supposed to be brothers like anyone else. And they shouldn't even encourage people to look at them that way. And if people do, they should try to discourage that. So that's, you know, you know you're in a cult, or at least what I would recognize as a cult, if the group you're in has a, a, a dominant leadership that does not give liberty to the people to, to disagree with the leadership about anything. And, and when, when that is the case, the leaders are very insecure. Uh, you might think they're strong people, but they're weak people. A, a, a pastor who is threatened when you question something he says or when you disagree with something he says, that person who's threatened is a weak man. He's not a strong man. He, he is compensating. He's trying to be strong by having a position of strength and saying, if you disagree with me, you're touching God's anointed. Don't touch God's anointed. Uh, he, he's basically trying to threaten people into respecting him because he doesn't feel like he can get anyone's respect any other way. Uh, he's, he's a man with low self-esteem, to be sure, but, uh, but high self-esteem in the wrong sense. So uh, you, many churches have this kind of person at their head. They think of themselves as sort of a corporate head instead of a spiritual servant. Jesus said no one should exercise authority over anyone else in the church, but you should, those who want to be chief must be the servant of all. So that would be my thoughts about it. You know you're in a cult or at least in a church that's got the dimension, the dynamics of a cult, which is maybe just as bad, um, if, in fact, you, uh, you can't disagree with the, the, the church. You can't think for yourself. And if you think for yourself, they, they frown on that. All right, let's talk to Joel from Portland, Oregon. Joel, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve. Thanks for taking my call. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to get your thoughts on a, a question that I've had for a while about um, it seems like miracles and moves of God have not been happening a lot in uh, recent times. And I've heard people talk about how um, there's a correlation between faith and, like, moves of God. Um, but one thing I've struggled with is, like, with so many people out there who seemingly have um, 
different motivations for like fame or money. Um, sometimes it's difficult to decide like what to put faith into or who to put faith into. So I was curious about your thoughts about I guess both of those things, like seeming lack of moves of God or miracles lately, and um, uh, uh, navigating the tension between faith and discernment. I guess. Okay, well, um, biblically, and even in church history, we could observe that there are seasons of miracles and seasons where there's not many miracles. For example, the Old Testament covers 4,000 years of history, but there's only three seasons of miracles after the creation. From the time of the creation till the time of Jesus, there were only two seasons of miracles. One was the season that surrounded the Exodus and the conquest of Canaan as a result of the Exodus. So the lives of Joshua, well, Moses and, and Joshua together, uh, that season, there were lots of miracles, the plagues on Egypt and the manna and the burning bush and those kinds of things. Um, the, you know, the sun standing still, that kind of stuff happened. But after Joshua, there weren't a lot of miracles. The book of Judges covers over 300 years, and we don't really see miracles happening there during those 300 years. Um, uh, in the days of Samuel, uh, there, weren't, there weren't much in the way of miracles. And David didn't work miracles, and Solomon didn't work miracles, and the kings of Judah and Israel didn't see many miracles. Uh, in the days of Elijah and Elisha, that was a second season. After the time of Moses, Elijah and his successor, Elisha, worked a lot of miracles. But that was like 700 years after Moses. Uh, so you've got hundreds of years, if not thousands of years at a time, where you're not really seeing miracles. Um, and, and then, of course, the next season of miracles was when John, Jesus came. Now, John the Baptist didn't even work any miracles. He had, the, he had the spirit of Elijah, but he didn't do any miracles, the Bible says. But Jesus worked miracles, and then later his apostles worked miracles. So that was another season. It's interesting how each of these seasons begins with one major leader, and it continues through his first generation of followers. Uh, we've got Moses and his successor, Joshua. You've got Elijah and his successor, Elisha. You've got Jesus and his successors, the apostles. Now, that doesn't mean the, the, the age of miracles is over. It just means that a season that was characterized by lots of miracles did come to an end in the apostles' lifetime, it would appear. I mean, Paul was working all kinds of miracles, raising the dead, healing the sick, those kind of things in his early life. At the end of his life, he's leaving his friends sick. Um, Trophimus was left in Miletus sick. Uh, his friend Epaphroditus almost died, but, but recovered just barely. Uh, Timothy had stomach problems that Paul couldn't heal. Paul himself had a problem he couldn't get rid of, a uh, thorn in the flesh. So you don't really see the same kind of miracles done at all times or the same amount of miracles. Now, in church history, there have been revivals. And during revivals, it's not too uncommon to hear reports of miracles, and I believe many of them are real. Um, also, when the gospel is going out to new territory, like breaking into areas that have not been evangelized before, during church history, many times those frontiers of world mission also see quite a few miracles where God's confirming the word with signs following. But again, these things are not really the norm that most Christians see. There appear to be you know, centuries at a time where God doesn't necessarily work miracles, and we can't necessarily say it's because no one had faith. We might think, well, if we had enough faith, then God would just do miracles all the time. Well, if he wanted to, he would. But he doesn't even need faith. He, he tells us to have faith, but he doesn't need faith to work a miracle. I've known people who got healed of cancer when they didn't expect to. They didn't have any faith for that. Uh, and I've known other people who had tons of faith, and they didn't get healed when they thought they were going to. So, you know, faith has some role in our response to God and in our trusting God in times of crisis and looking for relief and so forth. But faith doesn't necessarily make the miracles happen. Now, I realize Jesus said if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can move a mountain, but he's not speaking of literal mountains being moved. He's talking about, he's talking about the same thing. I think that the same image is used in Zechariah chapter 4 about the mountain that was in front of Zerubbabel, uh, which was the difficulty of reestablishing the nation after the exile. God was going to turn that mountain into a plain. And that he's going to remove the mountain that was obstructing 
Zerubbabel, but there wasn't a literal mountain. It was just difficulties in general. I think when Jesus said, if you have faith, you can move the mountains, uh, uh, then I, I believe that he's not really talking about anyone who has enough faith can actually work miracles. If he was, he didn't make his prediction a very, uh, his prediction didn't come true because I don't know of anyone who's ever moved a mountain, no matter how much faith they had. And I've known many people trusting God for miracles that don't happen. And other people, you know, they, at times, at times where miracles are frequent, they often happen to people who don't have faith. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge the health of the church by how many signs and wonders and miracles there are. Really, God sends miracles when he sees fit, when he wants to. Uh, God does not necessarily indicate that we can have miracles anytime we want to or, or meet certain conditions. That's what magic is like. Magic is that way. If you learn magic, you meet the conditions. You say the right incantation. You you boil the eye of Newton, wing of bat, and you're supposed to get the, 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 the results. That's because you're in charge of magic. The, the magician is in charge. In God's kingdom, God is in charge. He decides if he wants to do a miracle. If he doesn't want to, then it's not not necessary for there to be a miracle. And through most of Israel's history and most of church history, most people, including the very best believers, didn't see miracles. Um, now, I think I may have seen some miracles in my lifetime and because I lived through a revival. And what we need is another revival. But that revival may be accompanied with miracles when it comes. But its main feature should not be its miracles. So the main feature of a revival is people turning to God and becoming Christ-like and becoming holy. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to work more than miracles. Miracles are shallow things that get people's attention. The Bible says that God worked miracles to confirm the word uh, when when the apostles preached. And, you know, it kind of got the attention of unbelievers to realize, well, there really is something behind this. God really is behind this. But when it comes to living the Christian life, God is much more concerned about how, how we live as holy people rather than how many miracles we're seeing or doing. Okay. Um, and then just a quick comment about something another caller said about the millennial generation and um, how you felt like your program wasn't really um, maybe catered towards them. And uh, I just maybe wanted to say an encouragement. Um, I'm a millennial. A lot of my friends are millennials. And when I tell them about your program, they're like super into it. So I think maybe there is like something starting with the millennial generation where they are getting curious and like wanting to learn and um really study the Bible that, too. So. That, is, that is very encouraging, and I think I may have seen some slight signs of that myself. Again, most of my ministry has been to people, uh, I should say most of the people who've responded well to my ministry have historically been people about my age, but I have seen a growing number of millennials uh, getting excited about the Word of God, getting excited about Jesus, and and in many cases getting kind of excited about uh, this ministry as well. So, uh, you know, yeah. I think most millennials may not, but uh, there certainly are some that God is is moving that way, and I appreciate that. Thank you for the encouragement. Yeah, anyways, thanks for everything you do. Thanks again for taking my call. Appreciate it. All right, brother. God bless you. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye. All right. Uh, Lou from Los Angeles, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Yes, I was wondering, uh, Moses supposedly uh, wrote the first five books of the Bible. And I was wondering, how does he know about Adam and Eve and all that stuff that went on? He wasn't even there. He, how did he know what conversation Adam had with Eve and Eve had with the serpent? Right. And all those things that went on. He wasn't there. I don't understand how he can write about something he, doesn't, he was not even there. Well, lots of historians write about historical events that they weren't there to see. Uh, they use usually existing records. For example, uh, I, I gave a 30 lecture series on church history where I covered the whole 2,000 years. Now, I wasn't there for most of it, but I'm pretty sure that most of the things that I said actually did happen because I've based that on records, which eventually go back to the people who were there. And I believe that the events in the early chapters of Genesis, and and in fact, the whole book of Genesis, which happened before Moses was alive, I believe they were recorded. They were recorded by people, in my opinion, they were recorded by people like, maybe like... uh, like Seth, uh, or like Noah, uh, maybe even Enoch, uh, and and certainly Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and uh, Joseph, they may very well have recorded their stories. The real question is, where did Moses get access to those stories? And I would say the answer would be that since 
God was working through a certain family line from the days of Adam on through uh, Seth that uh, probably that family preserved whatever records were written just like some families today preserve the genealogies of their families and, and, and remember stories from their ancestors and so forth. Uh, not many families, do, well, more are doing that now that there's Ancestry.com, more people are getting interested in it. But back in my parents' day, people often had, you know, records of these things going back many generations, family trees and stuff. So, I mean, people in the family would have a reason to want to keep any records that were written by their ancestors about those things. And when Moses became the leader of that family, the leader of the Israelites, those records would have been at his disposal. And I believe that he probably wrote Genesis based on those records. That'd be, that'd be my, uh, the easiest answer to give. And I think probably the correct one. Okay. One other question. Uh, how, how, how is it that Noah and these other people can live hundreds of years old and yet we can't? Well, one thing that was different is that uh, the people who lived, for example, to be uh, almost 900 years old, all lived before the flood. After the flood, people immediately were living about 500 years. So the lifespan of people was cut all, practically in half between the, the year before the flood and the year after the flood. So the flood may have had some impact on longevity. Now, even though people were living 500 years uh, in Noah's day and following, that trailed down to the time of uh, Abraham. Abraham lived to be 175, and he was quite old at that age. And the lifespan went shorter and shorter. Eventually, in Psalm 90, which was written by Moses, it says that a man's lifespan is uh, three score years and 10, which is 70 years. Although Moses himself seemingly miraculously lived to be 120, and he was not, he didn't lose his vigor or his eyesight or anything like that. Apparently, in Moses' day, uh, 70 years old is fairly average. So, um, you know, it seems like something happened at the time of the flood. Some people think that atmos atmospheric conditions changed uh, and that something may have happened to, uh, to diminish the protection that the atmosphere had provided from the cosmic rays and so forth that come from the sun and from other places that, that, uh, that diminish our longevity. Uh, that caused each generation of cells after a certain point to be inferior to the previous generation of cells. That's only a theory. It may not be right at all. I don't even know if that's a possibility, but uh, I, I honestly don't know. But we do see a pattern. We see that until the flood, which was about, you know, like 1,700 years after the time of Adam, people did tend to live to be, you know, like 900. But after the flood, immediately that was cut almost in half, and then it kept going down. So sounds like the flood may have changed some things, though we don't know exactly what things, and we are left without knowledge of that. I appreciate your call. Let's uh, talk to Dean from South Southern California. Dean, welcome to The Narrow Path. Thanks for calling. Hey, Steve, you hear me? Yes. Yes, I have a question about uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Uh -huh. like what is inside of it? Uh, why God allowed that? And also if you could uh, explain where you think... Uh, it would be right now. Your first question is what? What was the what, what was in it or something? Is that what you said? The ark of the covenant. Yeah. Well, why God chose those things? Why He chose those uh, to put those in the in the ark? Okay. Well, the ark of the covenant was part of the furniture of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a building set apart for special ceremonies of worship, where everything was pretty symbolic. And the ark had its own symbolism, too. But the thing it represented was the presence of God with his covenant people. And the ark of the covenant was a box. It was a box made out of wood, but overlaid with gold. And it had a lid that was solid gold called the mercy seat. And what was kept in the box is the covenant, which was the Ten Commandments. Uh, it was made to be a container for the Ten Commandments. Now, eventually, other things were put in it, too. At one point, God had... Moses uh, take a golden pot full of manna, which was the food that God was feeding Israel with for the 40 years they were in the wilderness, and put that in there too with the, with the Ten Commandments. And then uh, later on, when God uh, vindicated Aaron against people who were rivals for his position by causing his rod to blossom and bud, uh, that rod was said to be put in there too. 
So we've got in the ark the Ten Commandments, and you've got the pot of manna, a golden pot of manna, and you've got Aaron's rod that budded, and apparently there's nothing else in there. Now, where is it today? Nobody knows. The the uh, furniture of the tabernacle is mostly carried off in 586 B.C. when the Babylonians destroyed the temple and tried to keep most of what was of uh, value in it. And there are reliefs that show them carrying away things like the, the golden candlestick that was in the temple and things like that. There's no, no depiction of them taking the ark. Now, the ark would have been very valuable, but there's some that believe the ark didn't go into Babylon. Uh, one tradition that the Jews have is that Jeremiah uh, rescued the ark before the Babylonians came and destroyed the temple, and he took it into Egypt, and that, you know, it was lost track of then after that. Uh, that's a possibility. We don't have anything in the Bible that tells us that. It's just a Jewish tradition. But it's possible the ark went into captivity in Babylon, uh, but it seems like it would have come back, but it, it didn't. Uh, it's uh, it's more likely that it didn't go into Babylon and that somehow it was rescued from the, the temple before it was destroyed. And if it was taken down to Egypt, it might be under a sand dune somewhere. There is a, there's a church in Ethiopia that claims to have it in their in their church, but no one's allowed to go in there to see if it's there or not. It's a long-standing tradition, but we have no way of knowing if it's true. Uh, some people think that they that someone has seen the ark in a cave underneath uh, Mount Calvary in Jerusalem, but I I suspect that that's uh, an urban legend. Uh, I don't really trust that that report. We don't know where it is now. If they ever did find it. It wouldn't matter because the Ark of the Covenant is, is related to the Old Covenant. And 2,000 years ago, God scrapped the Old Covenant in favor of a New Covenant, which Jesus made with his disciples. And so people who are followers of God today are doing so under the terms of the New Covenant, followers of Christ. And the Old Covenant is not relevant because the Bible says where there's a New Covenant, the Old one is obsolete. So the Ark of the Covenant represented the old covenant that God made with Israel that made them God's special people. But it's no longer relevant. So I, I frankly don't think it exists anymore. I, I doubt if they'll ever find it. But if they did, it wouldn't be important except as an interesting artifact of ancient Israel. It would not have any spiritual relevance to a Christian. Um, it'd, be, it'd be interesting to see it because it was really quite a piece of, of workmanship. But I don't think it really has any spiritual i know it doesn't have any spiritual significance today okay thank you very much all right thank you for your call dean god bless you you know um connie from san diego i'd love to take your call but i've got a feeling we're going to be off the air here in about a minute or so uh i'll just give you the choice do you want to say something in the time we have or do you want to call it back sometime when there's more time uh i think it'd be really fast go ahead okay uh, when a person has, uh, is saved, baptized, etc., and is walking with the Lord, trying to do the best they can, prior to that, the sins that a person has, there are consequences, long-term consequences to those sins. Um, Connie, um, I'm going to have to interrupt you here because I'm going to be cut off in 30 seconds. I'm sorry to say I do want to hear and, if possible, answer your question. So I'm going to ask you if you could possibly call tomorrow when we have more time i'd love to answer your question but of course uh, it would be uh, it would it would dishonor your question to try to answer it in 10 seconds which is about how much time i have so i apologize for that i would like to hear from you call tomorrow if you can you're listening to the narrow path radio broadcast we are listener supported if you'd like to help us out staying on the air you can write to the narrow path p.o box 1730 temecula california 92593 or go to our website. You can donate from there if you want. It's thenarrowpath.com. Thanks for joining us. Let's talk again tomorrow.